Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the uh, talk session of the uh, third Bangkok Edge Festival. It's the Ideas Festival. My name is Varin Sachideo. I'm in charge of this room for all the uh, sessions. So early on at 1.30, we had the talk on climate change, a very uh, uh, active and a very uh, riveting uh, discussions that they had. And uh, we look forward to uh, having a same discussion on this topic, which is uh, inching towards equity school <laughs> education and uh, LGBTQI uh, realities. So um, my moderator will be presenting uh, the panelists uh, for this discussion and uh, we look forward to uh, hearing uh, comments and uh, the questions towards the end of the session. The session will last for one hour. So uh, allow me to introduce our moderator for the session. She is Prem Prida Pramodna Ayutthaya. Currently is the Vice President of the Rainbow Sky Association, targeting hard to reach groups among the LGBT community and to introduce uh, the uh, knowledge and uh, the information about the uh, community to the wider public as well. Kun Prem's two master degrees, one was social development at Chiang Mai University and the other one was health social sciences at Mahiron University, uh, concerned rights for transgender people and sexual minorities. And uh, Kun Prem is also one of the uh, founding working group members of the uh, Asia Pacific Transgender Network. Please welcome Kun Prem on the stage, the moderator and uh, She'll be joined by our panelists. I will just call the names and Kun Prem will do the introduction of uh, our panelists, starting from Dr. Kevin Colliery, Dr. Kwan Ross, Kun Chon Chanok Pon Singh, and Joao Pedro Valerio. Thank you so much. And so, everybody, I feel really honored to be here as the moderator of this panel. And I think it's quite um, important for Thailand even in Thailand, that people believe that is a paradise for LGBT, but we still have um, some issues that we need to overcome and we have to work forward. Uh -huh. um, for me, I would like to kick off these um, panel discussions by sharing some information that um, in May of 2019, we have the big improvement for LGBT that we revised the curriculum for the schools uh, health education, and then we try to integrate LGBT issues for the students from the grade 1 to grade 12 in order to learn about gender diversity and also LGBT communities. But anyway, um, in December of 2019, we um, get the news report saying that um, it's quite a negative issues that the students bring the gun to the schools in order to uh, kill their friends, kill one friends, just because the dead one um, teasing, teasing the one who bring gun, that, that one is gay. So the bullying is still ongoing in Thai society just because of the gender identity. And we still need to think about how school can um, break down the silence and let everybody everybody, uh, I mean the students, school students and also community, to get to know how to include LGBT to be the member, the real member of the society. Today, I would like to introduce experts in terms of LGBT and also experts in terms of education. So we have four experts. The first one is Dr. Kevin Colleally. Dr. Kevin is an author of the social, uh, social studies curricula programs for the McGraw Hill education. He's also an assistant professor at the Graduate School of the Education at Fordham University, New York. Over to you, Kakun Kevin, that you're gonna talk about the curriculum and the, how to say, how to challenge society and how to make the curriculum for inclusive of LGBT. Take your time, please. Thank you, Kun Prem. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. So uh, our goal in the panel was to give a number of perspectives from around the world. So even though most of you might know me as normally waving the Portuguese flag, tonight I'm speaking about uh, what's going on in the USA. So I'm putting a different hat on my head uh, this afternoon. So uh, I'm here really to share a very specific story about uh, some work that's been done and that, that is ongoing in the United States. So currently in the United States, uh, 
we have four uh, of the U.S. states that have legislated inclusion about LGBTQI into uh, uh, con contributors or citizens into the uh, primary and secondary school curriculum. Now, for those of you who don't know, in the United States, we don't have a national curriculum. We don't have anything that is, uh, we don't have much, I should say, that comes out of our capital around education because most education is based on the localities and the legislation and the rules and the licensing and the curriculums, it all comes from the state. So that's why you see these four places in the US, three of whom very new. Actually, the Illinois governor just signed this legislation in August of last year. So it's really new for a lot of places. California, as you see there, is actually did it first and did it uh, a number of years ago. California is also where I have uh, more personal experience because I've been involved in creating materials that are used in the schools in California. So in California, the legislation is referred to as the FAIR Act, and you see what the, the acronym is about there on the screen. So what the FAIR Act does is uh, change or amend the California Ed Code, which is the legislation that, that defines what goes on in schools, to include contributions, to include the study of contributions, both of people with disabilities, very specifically to focus on people with disabilities, and also on lesbian, gay, uh, bisexual, transgender, et cetera. Now, LGBT was the phrase used back in 2011. Today, we say LGBTQI. It's this idea of the opening the awareness of the diversity around sexualities. So, that's what uh, the FAIR Act does. And I just want to share, the California Ed Code is a very long and boring legal document, but I just want to share one element of it with you that was amended with the FAIR Act. And you'll see there a long list of uh, individuals that teachers uh, and students are required to learn about in California. Well, the inclusion after the FAIR Act uh, into that list of people with disabilities and LGBTI Americans uh, ha was made law as of that time. So, okay, that's all very nice and good. And what does that actually look like? Or what does that mean? So in California, three years ago, we uh, created, or for California, I should say, we created a brand new series of elementary and secondary social studies textbooks and textbook programs. Now much of it is digital as well as being book related. Um, and I just want to show you a couple of examples of what this kind of legislation means when it gets translated into the actual materials for students and teachers to use. So here is a grade two spread from uh, the McGraw-Hill Impact Program. And you can see this is a family tree, something that we teach six and seven-year-olds about to learn about their family, their family history, et cetera. But you'll notice here on the right-hand side in the green circles that the students understudy, the two little ones at the top, they also have two uncles. Those two uncles have a child. You see cousin uh, Lucia there. So this inclusion of Uncle David and Uncle Chris in this particular spread, it, it might not seem like much to you. But I can tell you, as someone who's been involved in educational publishing in the United States for over 30 years, I never thought I'd live to see this happen. And while it may seem simple, it is incredibly powerful in the impact it could have with students to actually see their those students who are in gay, lesbian, uh, transgendered families to see themselves, but for me, more importantly, for all students to see the reality of our world today. The second example here is from grade four. And for those of you who don't know, Harvey Milk, of course, was a very, very important California hero. Um, he was the first openly gay individual back in the 1970s elected to a uh, large position, a government position. He was elected as supervisor of the city of San Francisco. He was, of course, eventually murdered uh, in that position. So it's a very sad story, but he's also a hero that we want students to learn about. So here in grade four, Harvey Milk's story is shared. So those are just two examples of what the legislation then impacts as far as curricular materials currently going on in the US. Um, 
Also, here's an example of the fact in California, this will impact, this has impacted social studies. It will also impact science moving forward. So here's an example of the science framework, which came after the enactment of the FAIR Act. And you see again the inclusion of people with disabilities and uh, gay, lesbian Americans in the science curriculum as well. So the impact continues as we move forward. Now, of course, this did not happen without any uh, kickback or pushback. There were many, many people for which this was a very difficult and a very challenging reality. Um, the educators and the, the districts in California always state that the FAIR Act did not mandate any kind of sexual or morality uh, specific education, but it focused on contributions of individuals. So uh, I don't mean to tell the story as it's all one happy, you know, wrapped up in a happy bow, because of course it's not. There is great continual pushback. And as I said, it's only these four states. So we've still got a very large part of the country where this is not in legislation. But um, this is, for those of you who might be interested, this is where you can go to get more information specifically about the FAIR Act. But I wanted to share the story here today to let you know that uh, things are happening in the US. And uh, while the struggle is not over, while this, none of this ends homophobia as we know it, we are, as the title of the session says, inching towards uh, equality. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next one, we have the speaker from Portuguese, in which I have to practice to pronounce his name correctly. No, you already know how to do <laughs> Yeah, perfect. So your name perfect. is Juwao. The next speaker is Juwao uh, Valerio. Juwao is a member of the Ilka Protocol Board, and also he is the LGBT youth activist. Zhao, uh, Juwao has been involved in the LGBT project education since 2004. And now, he is managed the Diversity Alliances. You are going to talk about the good practice in the protocol and also in Europe, how to guide the teacher to deal with the student. Are you ready? Yes, I please am. take your time, please. Yeah, it's just a topic. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the reality of Portugal and what, what we are doing and w how can we think that, how's the future and how can we inspire you in some way, I hope so. So despite a very solid rock record re regarding LGBTI rights in Portugal, it would be unrealistic to think that we live in a paradise, as you know. This doesn't mean that in Portugal every LGBT people uh, are welcoming or are not welcoming, it's just that in some places in Portugal, you can see the homophobia and the transphobia on a daily basis in a very present way. So no matter if you change the political situation, the most difficult thing is the social work and how to change people's minds. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans and intersex rights in Portugal have improved substantially in the last years. After a long period of oppression during the Salazar dictatorship, Portuguese society has become increasingly accepting homosexuality, which was discriminalized in 1982. Portugal has a wide-ranging anti-discrimination law, and it's one of the few countries in the world to contain a, ba a ban based on sexual orientation on the constitution. Since 2010, the state became the eighth country in the world to legalize the same-sex marriage, and a few years later, we legalized the adoptions for same-sex couples. On the 1st March of 2011, the president ratified the law of identity gender, which was on that time the best law in the world. Even if we change it again in 2018 and add a very specific topic that says that it's forbidden to do surgeries on intersex kids. Portuguese attitudes towards homosexuality have changed significantly since the 90s, and negative attitudes towards homosexuals have decreased. So now I would like to talk a little bit about a little uh, about the, the LGBT uh, uh, reality in Portugal and how did we get here. 
There is no official data about discrimination uh, use in Portugal, but we know is that according to a survey carried on a non-representative suburb with, uh, with 350 homosexuals and bisexuals, 34% of them stated that they had been directed victims of prejudice or discrimination from fellow pupils doing, doing their, their homosexual or bisexual orientation. According to the study, schools are the second most common context in which discrimination happens after the family. These figures should be read in light of the fact that sexual orientation is largely invisible in Portugal. According to the study, the revelation of sexual orientation to others is generally highly restricted, selective and reserved for homosexual friends. So, as you can see, even after we changed the law and since 2010, it's still very difficult for LGBT youth people to assume themselves. A study carried by Rede Execo, which is an NGO for youth uh, LGBTI people, which works mainly with young persons or developing proje projects for schools, says that there are still many instances of homophobia and transphobia in schools. In Portugal, and due to this, schools are still not a safe place for young LGBT people or people perceived as being LGBT. That's why we can say that the biggest challenge is not challenging the law, it's changing attitudes and mentalities. So, after our study, we have some numbers here. As you can see, 44% of LGBT youth reported having, uh, 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 having thoughts about committing suicide compared with only 26% of heterosexual youth. 50% of LGBTQI students reported self-harming compared with 35% of heterosexual youth. 53% of LGBT youth feel unsafe at school compared with only 3% of straight kids. And 50% of gay men and lesbian and women um, reported being victims or domestic violence compared with only 7% of heterosexual kids. So after these numbers we realized that we have to do something in Portugal regarding the difficult reality of LGBT youth people. So I'm going to talk a little bit about three, three different projects that we are carrying right now in Portugal. One of them is Alianças de Diversidade, also known as gay straight, straight alliances that also exist in the United States, but we are doing it in a very different way. So unfortunately, as you might know, the LGBT youth live in the fear of being rejected by their family and peers are afraid of homophobic and transphobic bullying. Many LGBTQIS youth become isolated and believe that they have to hide their sexual orientation, gender identity or gender expression from the world. What happens is that with this project, you at your school can feel safe and in, a, in an environment that you can assume yourself or express yourself fr freely just because you will have a peer support at your school. It's not just as another heterosexual kid adopted you, but you know that there are some other people, can be only one person, and can be a group of persons, uh, can be on a private way, can be in a public way, that you can express yourself. This is very, very important because me, myself, and I can talk of, uh, as, a, as, a, as a gay person, I can guarantee to you that your experience during the period that, uh, that when you are in school which would be much more positive and your academic results would be much more better if you feel safe, if you don't have suicidal uh, thoughts and if you think that you are a normal person. For me, I'm from a very uh, small city in Portugal and I can guarantee to you that until 12, I have 12 years old, I thought that I was the only gay man in the city because there was no one speaking about it. So this project is very important for people to, to meet other gay per persons, uh, other LGBTIQ persons, but also to feel safe on their environment. I would also want to talk about the Touch uh, Somos Precisos, which is like a project where uh, the schools invite our organizations to go there and to talk about gender identity, uh, gender expression, or, social or sexual orientation. 
it's not as the United States we have a specific curriculum regarding these topics. In 2011, we passed the, the, um, the minimum sexual topics law, which guarantees that everyone in schools should, uh, in some classes, talk about these specific topics. As you know, for example, a mathematics teacher sometimes do not feel comfortable to talk about this with their, ki with their kids. So they invite our organization to go there, um, and it's a peer-to-peer -peer education because it's young people talking with other young people about experience, about what means being gay, what means being trans, about legislation, about safe spaces, and so on. So it's very, very important. And the last one, it's the Observatory of Discrimination. The Observatory of Discrimination, it's just like the others observatory where everyone on an anonymous way can go there and if you felt threatened or if you want to complain about something that you see on the school, for example, you can go there on a very anonymous way, you fill the form, you send it to us, and every two years we are compiling the information and sending to the Ministry of Education for him or for her to know about what's the reality of LGBTIQ people in Portugal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. What I have heard is very really similar to Thai society in which um, teacher, the school teacher expect that the organization gonna get into a school in order to talk about sexual orientation and gender identity. And what we have worked, what we have been working is that to encourage the school teacher to feel comfortable in order to talk about gender identity, sexual orientation by themselves. But anyway, uh, the school teacher have the fear with the terms, are you? Are you? Because uh, their colleagues always uh, keep the eyes on and try to ask the question that if you talk about LGBT, are you the member of LGBT communities? And apart from that, the problem is that um, the school teacher feel reluctant in order to talk about LGBT, LGBT because feared of, feared of parents to complain about. So we're going to listen uh, more about these kind of issues from Dr. Kwan. Uh -huh. Dr. Kwan, the next speaker of us, Dr. Kwan Ross, she is a clinical uh, psychologist and she is the clinical director at the Litton Spouse Children Children's Center. She is the director at the Litton Explorers, director at the Rainbow Room Foundation. She is a uh, consulting psychologist at SAIFA. FIFA Youth Center. Oh, she has a lot of expertise and also she's tried to advocate for inclusive education and inclusive society. Over to you, please, Dr. Kwan. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. So I, despite all of that, I, I'd like to speak here as a mom, um, a mom of two boys, um, three and a half and one and a half year olds. Um, I think, um, you know, my son. My sons are lucky to have been been in schools that are quite open and inclusive, um, and and I think um, that part is important in their education. But I also think that as parents and family members, um, also as teachers, we have responsibility that we we you know need to take and and be more active in and educating our children about um, you know soji issues. So. Um, Usually, I will talk about five actions um, that I think are things that we as adults in children's lives can, can do to influence them, inspire them. So the first thing, and I think this is fundamental for everything that, that we're doing or that we're talking about today, is teach kindness and respect. We treat people, animals, objects with kindness and respect. Um, we teach ourselves also with respect and kindness. And, and it might sound easy to do, but it's not easy. Um, as parents, sometimes you, know, you beat up yourself down as you know, people, human. We, sometimes we beat ourselves down. But, but that's something that we want to inspire our children. Um, kindness is fundamental to everything, everything that we want our to children to, to learn and know about. 
Um, so, so that will, um, you know, tie into everything, the other, the other steps I will talk about. So the second action is actually know your values, your, your family values, you know, what you believe in, and, and really be clear on, on what you believe in. So you, sometimes you need to, you know, you can say, oh, you know, I, I support this issue, but at the same time, if you haven't really thought about it, you won't be able to actually, you know, justify why, why is it important for, for us to talk about this. Um, so, so be clear on what you believe in. Um, be clear on your family values, especially your nuclear family, because you will need to communicate that to your children. So research shows that if you communicate it, not just you know, show it, but explicitly talk about issues with your children, they're more likely to listen to you and to you know, adopt those beliefs too. Um, and the third thing is to actually recognize that you we all have biases. Um, and it's, it might not be easy to do. As parents, you, you're supposed to act like you know everything and you're teaching your children, but actually you don't. And um, society changes every day. So you want to, um, to actually accept that you, know, you don't know everything and you have your biases. We're only human, um, but one day your children might call out on you. Hey, mom, you're being racist, or you're being, you're being you know, uh, I don't know if it's appropriate, homophobic. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so, or you're using terms that are not politically correct anymore. Um, so, so, recognize that and, and also accept that people might be um, also, you know, biased in certain ways. And to be respectful um, when you approach them, to be kind when you, you know, confront them about, about their beliefs. Um, the fourth one is exposure, which is very important for younger children um, that, that I work with. So exposing them to not just a concept, but people in their lives, um, to um, people in the media, um, to discussions, to dialogues. And for younger children, sometimes they're not able to participate in that discussion, but just having them there when you're discussing it with other people or having, you know, um, there, there are a lot of story books that you can read to them or show them. There's this one really good book called The, the Family Book um, by Todd Parr, and it's just lots of pictures. But it talks about, okay, um, families are different and this family has um, you know one mom this family has two dads this family has uh, not all the children in this family look alike so, so it talks about different kinds of family but it's exposing sing children to to the idea um, and and the last thing I think um, is to is probably the most difficult one for me but is to speak up and to, to call out people, even people in your own family, um, you know, when they use homophobic terms or when they have, they communicate their biases, you need to actually speak up and show your children that this is something that's important to you um, and to your family values and you need to com communicate it very kindly and respectfully. So that's Remember, it's like the the, fun, the foundation of all all of this. Um, if you're mean, if you're if you're rude, then the children will pick up on the rudeness and the the unkindness in you. So so you want to be to communicate it clear, clearly, kindly, and respectfully. Um, I work in. Uh, um, I run a, a pre-nursery program, which I call an inclusive pre-nursery program. And, and I find that um, when we communicate clearly to parents our missions, our visions, our values, um, we get parents who believe in the same thing um, sending their children to join our program. And that makes it a lot easier, but at the same time, um, we don't get those parents who need to hear um, this topic. Um, I work in the in the youth community, or the community youth centers that I, I go out and, and work with the children. They're actually in their teens. Um, 
we get a lot of negative feedback from parents when we start touching, even on sex education. Um, they're like, why are you talking about this? You know, we will take care of that. You don't need to, to talk about it. But that's something that um, I think we need to do better at to, to actually not focusing just on the children, but reaching the parents and the community and educating them there um, from a respectful and um, kind manner. So that's my thought. Thank you so much. I think the parents' involvement is very interesting in order to stop the problem in educational um, sector. Because in Thai society, when we talk about bullying and gender-based bullying, we would like to get involvement from the parents' association. Because when the student get back home, things that get touched in the school may be, uh, how to say, the family members talk, talk to the student in different way. So that's why we needed involvement from the parents' association to be on the same page as the things that we try to teach in the school. For example, like LGBT, respect everybody, respect diversity, something like that. But apart from that, we still need the community to get involved in order to solve the problem about uh, disrespect diversity. Uh, the next speaker gonna talk about how the, uh, the, the general public uh, have the platform to learn about LGBT. The next speaker, last but not least, Kun Chon Chanok Pon Singh, the Assistant Director of the uh, Museum Knowledge Development Division, the Curator of Gender Illumination Exhibition at Museum Siam. She has a background about uh, history of art. She also has another uh, MA in Museum Studies. So over to you, Kun Min Chon Chanok. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to Bangkok Aid 2020, Jakapong Villa, and everyone who concerned about this issue. Two years ago, Museum Siam held an exhibition about gender diversity named Gender Illumination and in Thai name Chai Ying Sing Samut with me as a curator. Well, anybody have been here? <laughs> Thank you very much. This exhibition occurred to make a responsive and inclusive impact with society on diversity issue. The, the funds of the exhibition. So we want to create the exhibition for understanding and reducing prejudice for gender illumination exhibition, when we focus on diversity, the process was changed. Typically, I, as a curator, I have the power to make a storyline, to make a structure of content. But for the exhibition, I design my work. Let you see my concept of gender illumination. I think the aim of this exhibition is accepting diversity. When I create like that, I have to wait for create the exhibition for me as a curator. I do crowdsourcing process from the people in the society. And I concern voice of member of the society. And I don't re reproduce the own discourse. For audience, I think if I want they accept themselves, uh, I mean if I want they accept other, the first they should accept themselves and I want the museum like a change of agent or I want to make a museum for everyone. For my idea, I would like to say thank you to my boss, Miss. Kasara, and today she's here. She shared my idea, and she encouraged me to do the. I think is is the the best is the best exhibition of my life. When when I do crowdsourcing, I see the pressure of the member in the society, and I think some people find compassion. Friendship with a smile and tear. 
let you see my exhibition. I start with gender math. I think the word form in Thai language may be fake the identity of people. Like when you think of love, of gay or lesbian, I think someone thinks it's like a one night stand. And sometimes when you think of when you when someone think of the trans woman, that someone thinks it's a laughing stock person. But I think it's a it's the old discourse about LGBTIQ. The next is the gender base. The key of the gender base, I, I think uh, the, the people choose understand their gender. I think identity, attraction, and expression is depend on you. I think the gender no, no need the stereotype. And I create the all gender restroom or the genderless restroom. I want to tear down the barrier in, in case of the restroom wall in the public space like the, rest, like the restroom, like the toilet. And if you join to this session, you can talk with Long Phi Chai Ratamo. He talked about Buddhism and LGBT in Thai society. The next session is the Siam Gender Record. Uh, it is a history of LGBT and LGBT movement in Siam and Thailand. And then I finish the exhibition. I do this book. It is a history of LGBT IQ in Thailand with Kun Sulai Porn. She is a LGBT activist. If you want this one, it's in Thai language. If you want it, you can call me after that. And next, it is, it is a big part of the ex exhibition. It's a collection from the personal item from the member of Thai LGBT. There were about hundreds of stories and objects to join with us. And I would like to say thank you to Kun Pem Pida Pramod. She sent me a collection and her story to let you see her earring. Uh, it, I think it is a, the sign of acceptance from, from, from your mom, right? Okay. The next exhibition is Who Am I and Call for Up? I think when the people accept yourself, they can accept other. And the end of the exhibition is the survey and vote. Uh, a people who join this exhibition, I think around 30,000 person can vote about the question like, can, would you mind your child being gay? Or can, would you like to vote to gay politicians like this? And we we will talk about the result of the past after this. And for today, I think I, I would like to show you about teacher and relationship with students. For me, I, I still stuck with when I was a high school student, my friend Andrew, he came out, he said to my classmates, I am gay. After that, the, the classmate boycott him like, as a bullying. And guess what is my teacher did? Yet, <laughs> she, she ignored. She, she, she lets the event is, is go. And, and 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 I, I think the this 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 issue is is the is is the big question and is it like my passion to to do this exhibition. The next issue about the teacher and me is 
I like this issue is my wound. During the exhibition, a group of the students and teacher from our girls' school had visit us. But the students were not allowed to see the exhibition by the reason that teacher cannot explain this issue with parents and teacher association. I think teacher just my exhibition before they visit. And I think teacher is a chain agent when they turn off the lighting is effect to their student. But for me, we are not always disappointed because uh, when the trainee from Faculty of Education, Sibagon University, told, told me they are straight, but they're concerned about the issue about LGBT bullying. They want to do a workshop like a topic of the new generation of teacher not bully on bullying, perceived facts, and abusing LGBT IQ. Uh, there were about 100 young teachers joined with us for this campaign, and, and I'm proud of them. And I think the personal collection from, from my exhibition reflect society. The first one, let you see, is a stigmatized school report. Oh, the teacher write the school report to, to his parents. They, they wrote very well manner, almost like a girl. What happened? Why she, she, she do like that? Why? The, the owner of the report said the message of the teacher deliberately say about his gender, make him feel that the teacher is trying to improve the gender to children and wondering about masculinity. And, and for me, I think it, this is a big question of humanity. I think everyone can be whatever you want to be. And the, the next is the important permit of tran transgender life. I, I got it from the Kun Toto Kamna Sawakun. He is my brave transgender. He, he once wore a skirt to an examination because his ID say he is a female. Even though have been taking, he, ha he have been taking a hormone and living as a man, and then he submit the complaint to the dean, and the university, university changed the rule and allow he was banned. I think this is a literary reward for his attempt. And the last month, in Intelligentsia, it's an education journal asked me to write about the LGBT bullying in school, and I have an opportunity to interview the teacher. I asked a teacher in high school to solve this problem about LGBT bullying. They, they said, before we accept the diversity, first we must accept the difference. The important thing to show this for the difference is we can use the same method to all students. I think it, this, this is my hope for, for LGBT bullying issue. And for me, what I get the most from this exhibition, I think the challenge is calling false objects from the member of society. And I hope that the society in the future must be more liable than we have ever met. Finally, I think this world doesn't have only male or female. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kun Chun Sanok. So now I would like to open the floor if you have any questions to the speakers, please feel free to raise your hand. 
Does anybody would like to? Yes, please. Uh, my question is specifically for Kevin. Uh, I'm just curious uh, how it's been dealing with LGBT issues in an academic setting in a Catholic university such as Fordham. Like, how, how does that play into the, the discussion? Uh, well, first I have to say that Fordham is a Jesuit university. So, come see, come saw, Catholic. <laughs> yes. No, I'm kidding. Of course it's a Catholic university. But, uh, it, I don't have any impact uh, whatsoever from, I mean, except a supportive one from the deans or the, uh, you know, the people that I report to as a professor in the, I mean, my work, my research, et cetera, it's, it's never been an issue for me personally. Now, that's very privileged for me to say at, a, at the tertiary level in New York City. So there are many people currently in the United States in K-12 Catholic education suffering a great deal, losing their jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, I don't mean to diminish the issue because it's a huge issue, but personally, I, in your, your question about my experience at Fordham, it, it's been a, it's been a, my research, my work, et cetera, has been supportive. And, and institutionally, you feel like the, the university has been open to, to LGBT issues generally? For, again, in my experience, yeah. yes. Great. Yes. Thank you. I'm Beverly. I lived here and I'm taught. I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher of adolescence in ISB for many years and I taught sex education. And I want to thank the panelists for talking about this. Um, I feel one of the things that you have come and touched upon is the education of the teachers. It's a topic that's hot. No parent really deals with this properly. Everyone is shy, including the parents, the father, the mother, the auntie, whoever has the responsibility to teach about sex. It's usually muted. It's not something that's talked about. Nudity is not discussed in this society. And the feeling about your body when you are adolescent at 12 years old and 13 years old and 14 years old is you're very shy. You're unsure of yourself. You don't know who you are sexually or even humanly. And there's a lot of issues that deal around sexuality at this time, which if you train your teachers, you can deal with a lot better. One, of course, is bullying. No one, regardless of, of uh, whatever stance they take, sexual or other, needs to be the butt of a bully. And in the United States, one of the curriculum for all teachers is how to deal with bullying. Another thing I found in teaching, and I'm the sex ed teacher, and every one of the kids that I ever had kind of remembers that session. I taught it at the end of school when they knew me for the whole year. We had developed a relationship. I sent home letters to the parents to alert them that we're going to be talking about an issue and to have them sign off that we are that their kids might come back and ask questions that they're not to get all alarmed and we dealt with many issues one of the things we did is had the kids ask questions and we had a drop box you can ask any question you want and I had several classes and each class had their own question box I would draw out a question every day, and you bet everyone was listening. It didn't matter. And it didn't matter what they asked. I had a checklist which I was going to cover, and the question would lead into one of those topics at that class. And everyone got to the point where <clears throat> sorry, um, they were listening not only for their own question to be answered, but other people's questions. And they were laughing because they thought the other sex understood. And they didn't. And we passed around condoms. We passed around tampons. We talked openly of, of why the whole, they needed, and I told them that you need the words, not just the slang words, but the real words. So you can ask an intelligent question. And respect yourself, respect others, and to understand diversity. You teach it along with sex. I'm a biology teacher. I teach sex all year long. They just didn't know it. 
we got to human sex, they had to sign off on it. But when it comes to understanding life and what they were going through at that particular time, there needs to be a respect toward yourself, toward others, and also openness in the sense of curiosity, that it's OK, that it's usual, that you're not unusual, and, and a, a feeling of being able to be OK, no matter where you stand on this. Also, one of the things we taught was how to say no. You need to know how to say no to your friends without losing them, because you don't want to be left out. And so this is a skill to develop in all kids, and in fact, all of us. And you develop it over a lifetime. I, I'm sorry I'm going on a little bit more, but these are kind of the issues. As far as gender bathrooms, I think girls need to feel safe, because there's too much rape going on in all cultures that if a girl is in the wrong spot, you know, she's asking, there's, there's a mentality that it's OK to take advantage of that. So it doesn't matter what sex you are, you need to feel sec safe. Thank you, Beverly. I, I think that the comment about teachers is a very important one. I hit on it, uh, Joao hit, it on, hit on it as far as some of the pro programs going on. And you made a really good point about the role of teachers, both from a family perspective at the uh, lower levels, but even your experience in the, in the gender illumination, and to see the reaction of the teachers, both positive and negative. So it is indeed a critical element of success in this area. Yeah, I'd like to pick up on a point that uh, Ms. Ross made, Quan Ross, in your discussion, I think is extremely important for those of us uh, who are working out ways to uh, relate as gay individuals to younger generations in our family. I mean, I've grown up uh, with my identity very much out to my family. My nephews and nieces all knew it as they grew up, but now they have children who are in school and who are dealing with uh, homophobia on a daily basis because it has not improved, uh, in my view, at the school level in the United States where I come from, in spite of all the progress we have made over the past 20, 30 years in political uh, realities. Uh, these children go to school in places like Georgia, Louisiana, uh, Virginia, and there is still a lot of discrimination against gay people and minorities in schools throughout the American South where I come from. Uh, and your point is so well taken because we have to, um, we have to model that kind of behavior uh, for the younger generation and our families. And it's very difficult for me to not be harsh and reactionary in my uh, correction of people's homophobic remarks in company with my nephews and nieces. I want to jump on the person. You know, I, I want to attack the person because. It, it's just so wrong to witness that kind of behavior that they are actually encouraging in their children uh, who are with my nephews and nieces uh, in those kinds of uh, social and educational situations. So if I were going to design a workshop to raise awareness uh, for practitioners like yourselves, I would do role plays of the kind of thing that you mentioned uh, because I'm not really sure how to do it. I'd really like to, to learn more about how to uh, how to react to those kinds of things in a supportive way that don't put my nephews or my grandnephews and nieces, as the case may be, uh, <clears throat> in an uncomfortable situation. I don't want to embarrass them or uh, compromise their relationships with their peers, but at the same time I want them to hear something uh, righteous in that situation. But thank you very much for bringing that up. We still have like five minutes. One, two. Could you please bring the microphone behind the lang, I only have a quick question. I won't share my personal life story with you. No worries. Um, I would like to um, ask the Thai panelists um, what their take is on the question that I've had since I've lived in, in Bangkok. Why is there no Bangkok pride? Um, and hasn't been in the longest time, as far as I'm aware. Is it um, oppre the oppressive regime? Is it complacency of 
uh, the LGBT crowd? Is everything hunky-dory so we don't need it? What would you say? What's, why don't we have this? I mean, this is a phenomenon that's you know, growing around the world. But in Bangkok, one of the gay capitals, supposedly, we don't have that. <laughs> um, actually, we have the several prize events going on around Bangkok. And we adjust it to be, how to say, um, appropriate with the, with the socio-cultural context. So we have pride on the board. We also have different events like... Um, but this is a commercial. This was a very... T I mean, I was there. This is from the point nothing of, to do from the activist, the From the activist um, organization, from the NGO organization, we're going to set up um, Chiang Mai Pride. I think on the day 22 of February, and we also have Pattaya Pride in uh, maybe next week on the day 15. So I think that is the way we adjust the Pride event from Western context to be fixed, to be, to be fit with the Thai socio-cultural. Because in Bangkok, uh, I think the main reason that we don't have the Bangkok Pride is about the traffic. And we don't want to start any, how to say, activity that people blame on us that, oh, how important are you that you walk on the street in which people cannot go for work or cannot go for things that they want to. So if people start from blaming, I don't think they're going to have the understanding upon LGBT. I think it's good to have at the, how to say, physical, uh, how to say, location that allow to, to have the pride parade on the street, like Chiang Mai. Pattaya, so we have it. In Bangkok, we also have the Pride on the board. So that's why I think we never miss the event of Pride. We're also proud and we're also pride, but we adjust it to fix with the local context. Yes. So we also have the question from the back and also in the front, and maybe we have to cross the sessions. Please. Hi. Um, so I'm a teacher in a high school, and at the moment, the most I learn about LGBTQI issues is from my pupils. Um, and the safe space for them is in school at the moment, and they, they're really kind of establishing a good community. The biggest problem is parents being intolerant and homophobic. What do you think the best way to deal with those parents is? That's to the whole panel. Um, so. In Portugal, for example, we have uh, an, an, orga organi an organ organization like PFLAG. It's an organization for mothers and, and fathers of LGBT uh, people. Sometimes they they go to uh, meetings uh, of school reunions to talk with the other parents that are there just occasionally and talk about these specific topics if they are available to listen. Of course that most of them, they are not available because they think that they know everything and they are going to, to teach their child the way they want. What I can tell to you from our experience is that if you are doing that amazing job, you will one day contribute for your, the, your pupils when they change the mind of their parents. So I think that you are doing what you can do and it's going to have a, results, a result soon. Thank you. Uh, I would also add, in my experience, you need leadership in the school. Yeah. And by that, I'm not talking about the teachers. You need uh, the, the, school, the educational leaders, be that the dean or the headmaster or the principal, these people have to step up and say, this is a value in our school. And that message then also gets to the parents. Um, and the problem in many, many cases is the school leadership either doesn't believe or doesn't have the courage to stand up and say that. But I, I believe, I mean, back to Bev's point, I believe you can't put it all on the teacher. The teacher can do what he or she can do. But from a school community perspective, the educational leader also has to step up. So last question in the Thai context, thinking about education in Thailand, how confident are you that in the next few years we will see the Ministry of Education take that leadership role and significantly improve the situation around LGBTQI education and environment? Well, I, um, 
I think in a way, um, in Bangkok, I think we can impact a lot. Um, did you say in 10 years? Or? Yeah, I think I think in Bangkok we can actually you know there there's a lot of workshops on, on for teachers and and um, you know we work with teachers a lot. I think in the rural area it's very difficult and and that's where I think you know the stereotypes, all the biases exist more than than in the big cities. So they actually need the more um, support there. Yeah. I think the Ministry of Education have done such a good job in order to um, revise the curriculum, but anyway, they still need to improve a lot of things related. Um, and I think it's not only on the task of the Ministry of Education, but it's also about community. Everything about policy need to go irrelevant in parallel with the social attitude. And that's why in Thai society, I think apart from Ministry of Education, we still need the um, role model in terms of media. Because people get back to home at the end of the day, they sit in front of television and they consume a lot of the negative discourse about LGBT. And right now we work apart from uh, dealing with the Ministry of Education, we try to uh, encourage the good media to portray about the good image and accurate information about LGBT and that the new generation gonna know that LGBT is nothing negative. But you have to respect everybody, including LGBT. Yes. Does anybody would like to have, I think everybody is supposed to have the last sentence. Start from Kevin. The last word? The, yes, the last word. Well, I just wanna thank everybody for being here. Uh, this, is a, this is not a sprint, this effort. This is a marathon. And uh, we thought carefully about the title of the session, and the title of the session was very specific, that this, uh, this is happening. I feel hopeful about the future. I really do. But it's hard work, and it's slow work. It's often one student, one teacher, one parent at a time work. But the work needs to be done. So thank you for being here to uh, lend your support to that effort. So um, I would like to say for all of you that live here in Thailand uh, to fight every day for a different future because for our experience, I can guarantee to you that 10 years ago, we never thought that in Portugal, we have such an amazing progress at that nowadays I can tell to you that I can walk hand by hand freely on the street. It's something that you need to, to to understand that all the societies have specific timings, but please don't sit and wait. Go out every day and fight for the change you want to see. Um, my message is probably along the same line. So, you know, look at yourself um, as an agent of change, not just the teachers, not just, you know, people who, who work directly with children, but, but you can change and you can empower the next generation of people who will continue to change. I would like to say thank you for everyone who concerns about this issue. When I say gender diversity, I mean include men, women, and, and on of member of the society. And I think this issue is a tissue uh, everyone should concern about that. Thank you of the, uh, of the speaker. Could you please give the big round of applause to them? And yes, we look forward to see the improvement for LGBT, especially in terms of education. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And a big round of applause for Kun Prem as well for so moderating a session. Thank you so much for all the comments and all the uh, contribution to the discussion. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing the development on this issue in Thailand. And uh, our next discussion in this very room will be at uh, 4.30. So uh, if you're interested in recalibrating Asia's big powers, dynamics, we'll start at 4.30. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.